Amen. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. Mentally tested, Canaan approved. Mentally tested, Canaan approved. If I can draw your attention to 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5, where Paul says, yeah, I want you to get, examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ is in you unless, of course, you fail the test? You ever fail a test? <laughs> That's the question. Anybody ever fail a test? I need some honest people in church. Fail a test. My boys just graduated from high school and uh, on Friday, and praise God, we're, we're about to move on. Thank you, Jesus. House is almost on. Now my, soul, my soul looks back and wonders how we made it over. And, 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 but, but just because they graduated, I know there are so many of us graduated, students are gone, and so many folks have graduated, and, and school is out right now. But just because you graduate from high school, just because you graduate from college, just because you get your master's, that does not mean that school is ever really over. You are always working on some kind of test. Everything is a test. We are all constantly being tested. The Apostle Paul here is saying, yeah, yeah, just because school is over doesn't mean that the testing is over. As a matter of fact, School is a groove. It's something that I say to people all the time. When you graduate from high school, don't, oh, I'm going to take a year where I'm going to work. I don't know. You might, you might need to jump right in because school is a groove. Hey, you need to be used to being asked and examined and tested. I'm, I'm, I'm done my undergrad work, and now I'm done. Well, you better be careful because if you leave from your undergrad work for too long, once you, I don't know if you've ever tried to go back, and now you're back in there trying to get your brain around reading what folk are telling you to read and doing what folk are telling you to do it's just a groove that you are in it is a good idea for all of us to have in our minds that the tests don't really end it's something I say on a regular basis that everything is a test we are constantly being tested school is never really over everything is a test as a matter of fact even the challenges even the difficulties even what we consider failure still can work for our good if we grew as a result of it. Even my disappointments, if the disappointment and the thing that's not going the way I wanted it to go, if that thing pushes me towards my destiny, if I see it as a test and not just an attack, then I begin to realize, okay, God, there's something that you're working on the inside of me. There's something that you're trying to give to me. I remember being in school, and, uh, and I, I went to this very, very, very challenging high school, and uh, you had to take tests to get in it, and it was a tough school. And, uh, and I had this one particular teacher, my Latin teacher, in the ninth grade. His name was Mr. Liggins. And he used to love to give what he called surprise unannounced pop quizzes. <laughs> surprise unannounced pop quizzes. I don't know if you ever had a teacher that liked to give pop tests. It's one thing, it's tough enough to have a test that you have to study for, something else all together for you to come to class that day and not expect to be tested, but he just had an expectation for you to always be ready. He felt like if you read the stuff I gave you to do over the weekend, then you should be ready for a test. That tests don't always come with predictions. That sometimes a test will catch you unawares. Sometimes a test will catch you off guard. And in essence, what Paul is saying here is I'm just echoing his sentiment. And that is that you need to be aware that testing is coming. And there are several testers. Just when I started to think about the word and think about my life and think about how long I've been on the planet. There are several testers. And just, just as I introduce, there, there, I'll give you just a couple just to think about some testers because everything is a test, them testers that we all have to deal with. The first tester is who the Apostle Paul is, is encouraging us to be the tester, and that is you. He's saying test yourself, examine yourself to see that you're in the faith. Before anything else tests you, you ought to test yourself. One of the ways that you know you're mature is when you start to test yourself. One of the ways that you know that you really are growing in your education is when you give yourself a test. Before you take the test, you do self-tests. 
you meet with groups and you test each other because you want to test yourself before someone else tests you. So there is a test that you give to yourself. You gave a test to yourself this morning. I can tell just by looking around that you gave yourself a test. You looked at yourself in the mirror, hallelujah, to test to see, did you look right? You test yourself to see, do you think right? You test yourself to see if you smell right. God help us, Holy Ghost. My dad used to say that if you can smell you, you really do smell. If you're smelling yourself, you really need to think about bathing. Oh, hallelujah. If you can test yourself, you'd rather smell yourself than somebody else smell you. That there's something about testing yourself and a sign of maturity is when you give yourself a test and you ask yourself, am I really in the faith? Is my faith really where it ought to be? Am I really thinking the way I ought to think? Am I really in the right place that I'm not just so, uh, just so con convinced of my own superiority that I actually have enough humility to question myself and ask myself that? Do I really know what I'm doing? Am I really a good parent? Am I really a good husband? Am I really a good friend? Am I really a good member? Am I really a good worker? Am I really a good employee? Do I have to wait for the review to find out if I'm a good employee? Or am I looking at myself and judging myself and testing myself so that I will be aware of it? The first tester is you, and you ought to test yourself. Second tester is people. People will test you. Live long enough. Folk will test you. People will test you. People in life will test you. Your parents will test you. Your friends will test you. Your teachers will te test you. Your coach will test you. Your children will test you. Find out how saved you are when you get around people. Find out how much you really know the Lord when you get around people. People will test you. You find out how much patience you have when you get around people. You're not that saved if you can only be saved around saved people. And so, certainly, people will test you. I don't know why everybody's being so quiet. Y'all ain't even ate no ribs yet. That's tomorrow. People will test you. Folk in your life will test you. And I don't know if you've ever said it, but on a regular basis, I'll say, don't test me. Don't test me. Don't push me. Don't test me. I'm already on my last nerve. I'm not at my first nerve. I'm at my last nerve. Be careful testing me. People will test you. People will show you where you really are. Third test, life. Life will test you. Live long enough and life will test you. Be on the planet long enough, and the culture will test you. Be on the planet long enough, and just the circumstances of life, and the way that life goes, and how stuff works in life, and just stuff that's outside of your control will test whether you really know God. Test whether you really know yourself. Test where you really are, whether you really are happy or not. Te life will just test you. You might think you're something until you start living life. That's why when somebody 20 is talking to me, I'm like, just keep on living, baby. Somebody 30 talks to me, I'm just like, just keep on living, baby. Somebody 40 talks to me, I'm like, just keep on living, baby. I'm 50. Somebody 60 said to me the other day, you just got to keep on living. You ain't seen nothing yet till you lived a little bit longer. You think you know what you're talking about till you get another 10 years. And then life has a way of teaching you some things about yourself and about the world. Life will test you. And you will have to fight just to get up every day. And the devil is a liar that would try to make us give up on life. I was reading an article the other day that was talking about how high the suicide rate is in America right now. And how especially the suicide rate is growing amongst women in America. Mostly it's, it's been men that have been committing suicide. I rebuke the spirit of suicide in the name of Jesus. Because life will test you. But you've got to get back up. Keep on running. Keep on pushing. In this life, you will have trouble, but that life will test you, and you have to keep going, but life will give you a test. Number four, I'm just, this is just appetizers, not even the main thing. Number four, the fourth thing, fourth thing that will test you, the devil. 
I wanted to put the devil in all small letters. The devil, everything else was in caps, but the devil is in small letters because I don't want to give him any more glory than he already takes for himself. But the devil certainly will test you. The enemy certainly will test you. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but angels and principalities and powers. And the enemy certainly will make circumstances. I don't know if you're at a situation now where you're able to say, now that's the devil. That is the devil. That right there, that was the devil. That is the devil. I've come to the understanding that there is a demonic attack against your destiny. There is a demonic attack against the church. There is a demonic attack against my family. There is a demonic attack against the marriage. I was talking to a couple just the other day, and I was saying to them, you got to stop fighting each other and fight the devil. Enemy don't want nobody married. He wants, wants to wreck everybody. He understands the blessing that marriage can be. And if, you're, if you can't get over the, the issues with each other and focus on the attack, that's the, the enemy is testing you. And one of the best teachers and one of the greatest testers is the enemy. It is the devil. Not just the devil, but your enemy. Your enemy can teach you almost more than anything else about yourself. Sometimes we only judge ourselves by what our friends say. We only judge ourselves by what our mama say. We only judge ourselves but what, by what the people say who like us. But I would suggest that you listen to your enemies just a little bit because your enemies can teach you about your weaknesses just a bit. And you do need to hear what they have to say and how they're going to. You can't just work on just what you see. you got to listen to what the enemy is saying just a bit. Not to let it rule you, but for it to actually form you and shape you so that you can be ready for what God has for you. And then number five. E, the, the last one I'm trying to get to, the uh, one who's testing you, is God. God is watching. I'm excited that God is watching me. I understand that God is loving. I understand that God is merciful. I understand that God knows, but I also realize that because he's watching, because he loves me, because of his mercy, because he knows me, he knows what tests to give me. He knows what I don't know. So he knows what I need to be working on. And so he knows exactly how to give me the test that are the answers that I don't have. I don't know if you've ever taken a test in school and you just didn't know. For whatever reason, the stuff you studied was not what was on the test. God help us. Good teachers gave you a study guide, but I don't know if you ever, if you studied it and when you got to the test and you just so ready to take the test. My sons uh, were, took AP Calc, and so when they took the, I guess the AP Calc exam, I said, how did it go, son? He said, man, that first half of that test, I was on it. He said, but that second half of that test, I didn't know nothing that was on it. There's nothing worse than them giving you a test and it has the exact stuff on it that you didn't study the Lord knows exactly what you know he knows exactly what you don't know he knows exactly where you are he knows exactly what you need and he has a way of giving you the tests that bother you the most anybody have a teacher that called on people that didn't raise their hand Oh, help us, Holy Ghost. You want to kill those teachers. You're just sitting there just trying to keep your head down, acting like you're studying. And they call on you. Yeah, Mr. Thompson, we haven't heard from you all day. They know that you don't know. They're not. They're calling on you because you don't know. If you had known, you would have had your hand up. But they know you don't know. Call you up to the board to do the problem. And you don't know what you're doing. God has a way of knowing exactly what's going on with us. And God is going to put us in situations that make us stronger. And, and I'm come to that understanding in my life that the Lord is not going to leave me alone. I said, the Lord is not going to leave me alone. I trust that's not a prayer. You're praying like, Lord, can you just leave me alone? Lord, can you just stop bothering me? Lord, can you just stop sending folk my way to make me mad? Lord, and the Lord's like, no, I'm sending folk your way who make you mad so that eventually they will make you mad. I'm trying to work some patience in you, and I'm trying to work some perseverance in you. And I'm saying, Lord, I hear you, but, but why am I taking this test again? I'm taking this test again because I failed it the last time. 
I know I'm not the only one that got cut back. I am in the fifth grade again. I'm looking at the same. I got all new friends in the fifth grade. I was supposed to have moved on from this, and I done got cut back. Because the Lord knows the stuff that I need to keep working on. In Numbers chapter 13, God gives the children of Israel a test. Canaan is our theme for the year. And if you're aware of the children of Israel and their battle for Canaan, you know that in Numbers chapter 13 and in Numbers chapter 14, they rebel. The first group that God promised to take into Canaan didn't make it. And these two chapters here are the pivotal moment of them not making it. It's one of the scariest things about God, that God can make you a promise, but if you're not careful, you'll disqualify yourself from it. That the first group that God promised land to and property to and Canaan to didn't actually get to walk in it. It was a test. It wasn't Moses deciding to do this. It was the Lord who said to Moses, I want you to send some spies into the land and see what's going on over there. It wasn't Moses' idea. When I first read this, I was thinking, man, whose idea was this? From I never really read the verse. And they gave it, they, if you see it, they gave it its own verse, verse 1. It's just a very short verse in which it says, then God said to Moses, God said it just for, for folk to know it wasn't Moses who said, hey, let's go see what it is. No. Then the Lord said to Moses, hey, let's test where everybody is. We're about to fight a battle. Let's give everybody a test so that they can see where they are. We know that God knows. We know that God knows our thoughts are far off. And so for the Lord, the omniscient one, to say to Moses, I want you to send spies into the land. That ended up being disastrous. They ended up spending 40 years in the wilderness because they failed this test. What I'm calling the Canaan test. Can you own outright? The Canaan test. Can you own outright? Meaning, can you own and don't owe nobody on it? Speaking this over all of us in the name of Jesus. Can you own your car and don't nobody own it but you? Hallelujah. Can you own your house and Wells Fargo ain't got nothing to do with it? Can you own your property and you're not dealing with any lender? Can you be the lender and not the borrower? When I'm talking about Canaan, I'm not just talking about spiritual stuff. I'm talking about ownership. Can you own property? Can you have it? Can you say it's yours? I'm at a point right now where I'm saying, I'm realizing there's not a whole lot of stuff that I can say is mine. It's mine, but it's the bank's, really. And I'm just paying the bank to try to own it outright. I'm trying to be free and not be a slave. God help us. I don't want to just be set free from spiritual stuff. I want to be set free from physical slavery. I don't want to give all that I make to someone else for them to be wealthy. I need a witness in this early service. I am tired of giving all of my check to all of somebody else. I would like to own something myself. I would like for my children to own something themselves. I would rather them borrow from me than borrow from somebody that's going to charge them interest. Beloved, I know we don't like to think about it because it's church, but we slaves in here. When we talk about being set free from Egypt, understand that Egypt is a form of slavery. And if you buy a house for two fifty dollars and end up paying $600,000 for that house, you are a slave. Oh, help us, Holy Ghost. When I say Canaan, I mean, can you own outright? Can you pass the Canaan test. When I look at Numbers chapter 13, I see that God gave the children of Israel a test. 
I'm calling it a Canaan test, and I want all of us to take it. I want us to test ourselves to see if we're in the faith, and I want us to give ourselves the Canaan test because my prayer is that the Lord will bless us greater than we've ever been blessed before. My prayer is that in this year, God will work a miracle in your life. That's my prayer. I don't know if, you, if you're here with me, but my prayer is that God will work a miracle in your life. My prayer is that you will have equity. My prayer is that you will get something worth more for less. That's my prayer. My prayer is that you will have the courage to break free from your slavery. You, you should. We got to look at the children of Israel and actually see their struggle was a very real struggle. We can't can't just dismiss their struggle their struggle was a real struggle because there is a certain comfort level in slavery there's a predictability in slavery you're a slave but you know the master got it so at least you know you're gonna eat you know your check's going to come, even though you know the company cares more about itself than it cares about you. And if you're not careful, eventually they may just drop you like a hot potato and lay you off because they can bring somebody in younger and pay them less than you. And they really are about their cut. They got to answer to their shareholders and they got to answer to them. And they care about you, but they don't really care about you. But you don't really want to think about that right now. You just want to get your check. And the, the idea of owning or having your own thing or working for yourself is a scary idea, but it is a Canaan idea. And I don't think we ought to be the people of God and worship the Lord and praise God and not be determined to break free from Egypt. I am speaking life over us in the name of Jesus, over every one of us. I'm saying that they took this Canaan test. Let me share it with you really quickly. I see, what, five pieces to the Canaan test. The first part of it, number one, in verse 17, says when Moses sent them to explore Canaan, he said, I want you to go up through the Negev, and I want into the hill country. I want you to see what the land is like. I want you to see it. So the first test is the sight test. That's the first test, the sight test. What did you see? What have you seen? What did you see? What have you seen? Have you gone looking? Have you left out of a service and said, all right, that's right, the devil's a liar. I'm going to walk by faith. And I'm going to go look and see where I want to live and what I want to own and what I want to have. I'm actually going to do the test and see, do I have any equity in this house? Am I upside down in this car? I got to get out of this thing if I'm upside down. And I got to get rid of it. I got to get me a hoopty. I'm going to have to face the reality of what's really what. Can't allow my ignorance to just be bliss. I've got to actually look and see what I see and ask the right question and actually know what I know and see what's actually out there. What do you see? What have you seen? What is it that you're looking for? Do you even have a desire for greater? Do you even have a desire for more? My challenge to you and to all of us is to go for Canaan. And when I say go for Canaan, I'm not talking about spiritual things. When I say go for Canaan, I mean land, I mean property, I mean ownership, I mean equity, I mean, I mean you work for yourself, I mean God blesses you in a city, in the field, I mean that you may, be, you may go through a wilderness to go into the Canaan. Meaning that you may go through a period where it may be dry but God somehow provides. Help us, Holy Ghost. You may go through a period where there may be some desert and you may have some insecurity and you may have some stuff in which you're not sure, but the wilderness is worth the journey if Canaan is at the end of it. But I refuse to stay comfortable in Egypt because I have the knowledge that really I'm a slave. So I look into the Canaan. I see it. I'm coming through the wilderness and the wilderness experience doesn't have to be 40 years. It ended up being 40 years for them, but it don't have to be 40 years if you can see the right stuff. That's the first thing, the sight test. In verse 20, he said, how is the soil? Is it fertile? Is it poor? Are there trees in it or not? Do you best to, best to bring back some of the fruit of the land? Second test is the taste test. The sight test, the taste test, the try it test. 
Just try something finer. Help us, Holy Ghost. Try something finer. Just save up enough to fly first class one time. Just save up enough to stay in a five-star place just one time. Stop staying in a Motel 6. And save up enough just one time to stay in a hotel. Taste and see that the Hilton is good. And then end up with, a, with, a, a, with now a desire for something greater than you ever had before. You can actually just stay ignorant and just keep eating that cheap stuff. Or you can actually save up one time and eat a steak that's not chewy. Oh, help us, Holy Ghost. Just one time, just the taste, just to try it. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you don't want to taste something because it's going to mess you up. I don't know if you've ever tasted something and it messed you up. What you were calling gumbo, you can't call gumbo no more because you actually went to New Orleans and somebody made you some crawfish etouffee. And after that, you don't even want to hear nothing about no gumbo from nobody that ain't in New Orleans. The tasting messed you up. You ever try something just one time, if you ever tasted it, he's saying, listen, we've been in the wilderness. Bring some of the fruit back. You think that they brought that fruit back without tasting it first? Don't nobody get around a grape without tasting it. Oh, I wish I had a witness in the building. If you're in this room and you buy grapes at the fruit stand or at the grocery store and you don't taste one of them grapes, you are saved at a whole nother level. If eating one grape is stealing to you, may God bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon I'm going to taste one of them dirty grapes before I buy a whole bunch of them nasty. There's no way I'm not going to taste a dirty grape. There's no way they didn't taste it. I'll pop open that little case of blueberries and taste one of them dirty blueberries in there before I buy a whole pint of sour lemon blueberries. What I'm saying to you is that I'm going to taste it and see. You ever go into like a Harris Teeter or something? Excuse me, Harris Teeter, y'all, is a grocery store here in North Carolina where God lives. <laughs> you ever go into a Harris Teeter and they got the thing in there where you're just supposed to taste it and you just, you just pile your hand up anyway. <laughs> taste and see that the thing is actually good. Can you even dare to taste it? Can you even dare to try it? I was in a store, I was in California, and I went into a store, and I went inside the store, and they had some shoes in the store that cost $1,000, $1,000 for a pair of shoes. And I was with somebody, and they were like, yo, man, you want to try a pair on? And I said, no, I do not. The devil is a liar. Are you, you better get out of here. What if them $1,000 shoes start rubbing my feet? What if, for all I know, these $100 shoes feel good to me. I don't need no thousand dollar shoes messing my whole shoe game up. What I'm saying is, is that there is a tasting that is a part of the test. There is a trying it that's a part of the test. And some of us can be just so scared. I know I've been there where I'm almost narrow minded because I'm afraid if I try that thing, it's going to cause dissatisfaction with what I've always been all right with. He wanted them to be dissatisfied. He sent them in there to taste it and see. Then the third test that's a part of the Canaan test is what I'm calling the test of time. They were there for 40 days. They went up and explored the land. They went all over the place. They took their time to see it. They didn't make a quick judgment. They were there for 40 days. It wasn't just one good day. They were there for a while. Sometimes time will tell you that this thing is worth it. Sometimes we're just in way too much of a hurry. Haste makes waste. I don't know if you've ever just been in such a hurry, such a quick, just in such a rush. I, I come to the understanding that there is a testing of Canaan in which I got to take my time and really evaluate, do I want to live here? 
Is this the neighborhood for me? Is this the company that I want to work for? I've got to take some time and really examine it because I've come to the understanding that if I make the decision too quickly, I may lose confidence in the decision later on. So they actually took some time, and a part of this Canaan test is the test of time. Then number four, which is the hardest test for all, of all, and it's where they failed and it's where a lot of us fail, is what I call the risk-fear analysis test. Verse 28, they said, the people who live there are powerful and the cities are fortified and they're large. And we saw descendants in Anak there. The Amalekites are living in the Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, Amorites live in the hill country. Canaanites live near the sea along the Jordan. We can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. I don't know what they thought was going to happen when they got to Canaan. If the land is good and flow with milk and honey, then there are going to be people there. There are going to be good people there. There's going to be big people there. The question is, is your risk worth your fear? It's the risk-fear analysis test. You judge and then you decide, is it worth the risk? If you think that you're going to get saved or give your life to the Lord or have a relationship with God and have no risk, you got another thing coming. Risk is a part of life. You got to ask yourself, yeah, but is the risk worth the reward though? Yeah, this may be a risk, but what will I get if I fight the giant? What exactly do I get? David fought Goliath, but he didn't fight him for free. What do I get if I kill Goliath? All right, well, you get to marry the king's daughter. Okay, where's she at? All right, okay, she look good. All right, I'm going to fight her for that. And he ain't fight Goliath for no scary girl. He said, all right, okay, what else do you get? Well, your father's, you and your father's family will be exempt from taxes. Exempt from taxes? Now you're talking. What would you do to be exempt from taxes? Oh, I, I need a witness in the building. What would you do? Oh, hallelujah. Who would you fight to be exempt from taxes? My point is, is that David did a risk fear analysis. Sure, Goliath could have killed him. Sure, there was some fear, but the value of the risk was worth the fear. I don't know if you really can be successful if you can't face fear. I don't know if I can really be successful if I can't face fear. And it's the excellent question. Is it worth the risk? What happened to the children of Israel is they went there. They saw the land, but the fear of death and the risk of their lives was not worth the blessing of Canaan. And it's where they failed because the fifth part of the test Caleb silenced the people in verse 30 and said, we should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. That's the fifth test. It's the faith test. It's the faith test. It's can the word of the Lord conquer your fears? Can the word of the Lord conquer your fears? Can you say, yep, that looks scary, but God has made me a promise. Yep, that don't look good, but I got a word from the Lord. Yep, that looks like I might lose everything, but thanks be to God. I got a prayer life. Thanks be to God. I've talked to God about it. Thanks be to God. I've got God on my side. And listen, I'm, I got a word from the Lord. I'm standing on my word from the Lord. Though there may be giants in the land, I'm not going to be afraid because God gave me a promise. Caleb said, listen, man, it don't matter what's going on up in there. If God is for us, who can be against us? And can the word of the Lord sway you over your fear? That is the test. That is the test of life. It is the test of salvation. What good is all of this worship if you let your fears rule you? What good is all of this praying if I'm going to let the thing I'm afraid of stop me from moving forward? If there's one thing that I will fuss about to myself or to my children is if they say something about fear. I refuse to be ruled by fear. I refuse to let my fears rule me. I want to be ruled by what God said to me. I want to be ruled by my faith in God. I want to be ruled by my faith in myself. I'll just trust in God. I'll just believe the Lord. I'll just trust in who I know. I'll just trust my connection. But I'm not going to allow a fear to push me back from a promise that God has made me. The children of Israel in this particular group were unable 
to let the word of the Lord and the word of the leader help them over their fear. Because sometimes the word of the Lord comes through a person. Someone that you look up to. You sit down with your mama and your mama says, baby, you can do it. Nothing can stop you. Can that word make you say, yes, nothing can stop you? Or are you so convinced of the possibility of your own failure that even a word in the earth can't help you? Bad enough if a word from the Lord can help you. But what happens when you sit down with someone who you trust, who you have confidence in, and they're sitting there trying to convince you of the possibility of your own success, and you refuse to believe it? The devil is a liar. It's possible to be so lost in your fear that even a person that you have confidence in can't get you to believe that God is able. And it's a test that we fail. It's a test I'm determined not to fail. I don't know if it's ever happened to you. I don't know if anyone has ever come to you and asked you for counsel, asked you for advice, asked you for your wisdom, and you give it to them, and then they just sit there and argue with you. They sit there and argue. You're sitting there telling them how it can happen, and they're sitting there telling you how it can't. And you get to the point where you're saying, well, why did you come and talk to me? Why did you even call me if all you wanted to do was argue with me? I didn't come here to argue with you. I came to tell you that if God is on your side, and you look like a winner to me, and it seems to me like God can make a way, and it seems to me that God is able, and you want to be careful that if a man of God, a woman, woman of God, someone that you know to have confidence in God and a relationship with God, someone that you trust and believe in. If they speak a word to you, you have to be careful to give up on that word. You have to be careful not to give up on that word. Because you're almost at your last leg if someone in the earth can't say something to you. Good God. It's one thing for you to feel like the Lord spoke to you. Very few of us have actually heard an audible word from the Lord. Most of the words I hear from the Lord are in my heart. I, I'm hearing the Lord, and I'm saying, well, I believe the Lord is leading me here. And the Lord is saying this to me. But, but if, if beyond just the, the inaudible word of the Lord, if somebody in my life that I have confidence in, says to me, surely you can do it, and I still walk out of there and don't do it, then I really have to examine myself to see if I'm really in the faith. And I can preach about that because I've been there. I've been there where someone I believed in and had confidence in told me what to do and told me how it would work, and I said, thank you very much, and I left and did not do what they said. I know I'm not the only one. I left and was like, well, they, they, that was nice, but they don't know my situation. That was nice, but they don't know what's going on with me. That was nice, but they got money I don't have. That was nice, but they got stuff. My situation is different. They in Dallas. I'm in Durham. My situation is different. They in Texas. I'm in North Carolina. Their, their situation is different. I made all the excuses. I went to get counsel and didn't take it. And I'm back here at the same grade. Good God, save us from 40 years in the wilderness. Stuck in the in-between place because I could not trust the counsel of someone that I said I respected. That I understand that the test of Canaan is so serious because it's bigger than just spiritual things. It is dependent on our response. It's one of the most challenging things in all the Bible. You can get all kinds of stuff as a result of what Christ did for you at Calvary. There's all kinds of gifts that will come as a result of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There's all kinds of blessings that can come over you through prayer. But if you're going to take possession in the land, you're going to have to pass some tests. Oh, help us, Holy Ghost. If you're willing and obedient, you'll eat the best of the land. And I've been around saints my whole life who had amazing prayer lives, but in the land, they had no possession. So nobody want to say amen on that one. 
They had no possession because the, the possession test is different than the salvation test. In salvation, you can come to God just as you are without one plea. But if you're going to take possession of some property, then you're going to have to get yourself together and get your thinking together and get your mind right and see right and taste right and hear right and walk right and believe right and trust right. Because there is a possession power that you can't fake. There's a possession power that comes as a result of the test. I want to be mentally tested and Canaan approved. I've come to the understanding that it's not just enough for my spirit to get together. If I'm going to take possession of the land, then I got to get my mind together. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Lord, help us to think right thoughts. Lord, help us to think the right stuff, see the right stuff, and taste the right stuff, and, and do the right risk-fear analysis. Lord, overwhelm us with your power so that our minds will work right. Not just our spirits, but our minds will be fit to take possession of the land. Lord, make it so. Lord, make it so over everyone that's watching. Lord, make it so over everybody in the room. God, I thank you now for making us the head and not the tail, above only and not beneath, always at the top, never at the bottom. Thank you for the plan you have for us. Thank you for your anointing that destroys the yoke in us. Have your way in us. In Jesus' name, we all sit together. If you heard a word from the Lord, put your hands together. Bless the Lord real quick. Come on, put your hands together. Bless the Lord.